Hi, my name's Russ Taylor. The year is 2020, and we're about six months into the COVID-19. But my story started in 1971, when I joined the Merchant Navy. But first, I've got to give you a little bit of my background so you can understand where I'm coming from. Um, at the age of seven, uh, my father told me and my two sisters that my mother was lost. What did she mean? He said he'd been in London and she'd uh, disappeared and she wasn't coming back. That really uh, hit me like a hammer on the head. I didn't know what was happening. Of course, good things happen, don't they, at birthdays and Christmas. And we all thought she'd come back, but she never did. Then the next blow was when I was the age of 10. At the age of 10, my father went into prison for the second time. My father was like a career criminal. He was one of the 50s rogues. He wasn't a violent man at all, but he was uh, blowing up banks um, with gel ignite. This is my background. And at the age of 10, I had to go and live with my grandparents in the north of England. Now, you need to understand that I, from the age of seven, I was really beginning to hate my mother. So much so that when friends said, where's your mum? I used to say, my mum's a bitch and my father's a criminal. So you can see that something was happening in me was really hurting me. Now we jump forward to when I was living in Westcliff-on-Sea and uh, I was living in digs at the age of 17. The landlady's son had been uh, on merchant ships and he said, why don't you join the Merchant Navy? You'll see the world and you'll get paid for it. So that's what we did. We joined uh, p and I joined the SS Canberra and uh, it was a bit daunting uh, to go down to Southampton and uh, join the ship. In fact, it was sailing the next day and they were looking for the last bits of crew and I was joining really to see the world. And when we went into the purser's office, he had a clipboard and he said, right, uh, two waiters. Well, me and my mate who joined with me, we said, yes, we never waited in our lives. And he said, OK, go down to the restaurant. It was a two-class ship then. Go down to the restaurant and go and see the head waiter. So we were a bit excited and wondering what we are going to do. We'd never waited on tables. The head waiter said, oh, I'll get one of the others to show you. And so for the first two weeks, which was a cruise into the Mediterranean, we learnt the ropes of being a waiter. That was fine. Our second trip was a three and a half month round the world cruise. I got used to being uh, a waiter now. I was finding my feet. There were lots of parties. There was lots of drinking. Alcohol was very cheap because it was duty free, but I was never really happy with drinking all the time. And I didn't really like it until then once one day somebody introduced me to smoking marijuana. So I thought, well, I'll give it a try because I used to smoke cigarettes anyway. But it didn't affect me. And I said, no, nah, it's nothing, you know. And they said, oh, no, no, no. You've got to learn how to smoke it, really hold it in your lungs so it gets into your bloodstream, you know. So I did that and I thought, wow, this is it for me. I'm uh, no longer the straight man that works nine to five. I now can see life in a different way. So I began, we had a lot of drugs on the ship, and I began smoking a lot of dope. And uh, that, back then it was the hippie era, you know, peace, love, and all of that. And uh, of course, mixing with uh, the drug scene, I was introduced to other drugs. And what could be more cool than to take LSD in San Francisco, which is the first time I took it? But I was introduced to speed, enamel nitrate, and um, we, because of the hard work set at the Christmas time, we used to take speed and um, talk non-stop and work non-stop without any effects. 
But obviously this was beginning to take a toll on me and I wondered where it was leading to. I came back home and my, my uh, sister saw a big change in me. But I thought I was being cool. You know, I thought everything was okay and I was in control of everything. But the reality was I was getting deeper and deeper into the drug scene. And uh, our next trip was four and a half months around the world. And I got more heavily into the drug scene on the ship. And um, that's when things began to start go wrong, when things began to go wrong for me. I began to be more paranoid. I began to have be more fearful. And then uh, this is what happened. This is, this is my story. And you may think, well, you know, it's a bit like a, a Dracula film or something. How, is this real? Well, I can assure you, nearly 50 years later, it's very real. And as a fear came over me, I thought, well, what can I do? And I had two ladies who joined the ship this is the SS Canberra in Hong Kong. And they were on my table and their names were Judith and Beryl. That's all I know about them. And I thought they were very odd women because they used to pray before their meals. It was strange. And uh, I didn't think anything of it. I thought they were a bit odd. Except uh, now I'm kind of moving forward towards the end of the trip. We're coming up to May. 1972 and um, I thought you know I'd been given lots of things when we were scoring drugs in places like Acapulco uh, in South Africa and I'd been given things and I wore them I banned the bomb sign I had round my neck that was given to me as a present a, um, a crucifix I think it might have been a rosary I was given this in Mexico in Acapulco and uh, um, it had a cross on it, and in the center it had a head of Jesus and the scene of Calvary embossed on it. And I thought, oh, that'll protect me, I'll wear it. So I was wearing this. And now I'm fasting, fast forward to April the 30th, which I don't know if any of you know, is a festival of Satan. It's called Walpurgisnicht. I didn't know anything about this. Um, in fact, when I found out the word, I called it Walzburgurus because the W in German is pronounced Walpurgis and it's from the, the opera of Faust. And in that opera of Faust, it's on this night that Satan comes for your soul. I have to keep telling you, I didn't know anything about this. All I knew that was something very strange going on. So on the next day, on May the 1st, 1972, my uh, passengers, Judith and Beryl, in the morning after breakfast, I said to them, if I need help, will you help me? I don't even know why I asked them. I had terrible fear coming on me. I could tell that there was something very evil on the ship. And they said, oh yeah, yeah, uh, we, can, we can help you. And I thought, well, how can they help me? It was only afterwards I realized that they'd been praying for me. And um, it, it, then the evening came, May the 1st, and um, my first passengers came into the, uh, into the restaurant. Then there was a second sitting, and Judith and Beryl had been on the first sitting. And uh, remember, I'd said to them, can you help me? And so they'd given me their cabin number, which I kept in my top pocket. The second sitting was starting, a couple of passengers came in and they asked me for uh, tomato juice, which was on the menu. Um, and after the first sitting, all the waiters, was four or five hundred waiters, I mean, it was incredible, they had the tomato juice on a buffet bar. Now it gets spilt on the floor, somebody gets a cloth and they clean it up and that was thrown aside. So as I was going over to the urn to get these tomato juice for these passengers, I started to hear wailing and sounds and bells and chimes high up. Well, the, the ceiling, the deck head on a ship is very low, but this was high and I wasn't aware what was happening. And 
It was as if somebody was pulling cords across my mind, little by little, little by little, like I could see my mind in front of me. And slowly but surely as I walked over, then when I saw the spilled tomato juice and the, the cloth, the white cloth that had cleaned it up, it was blood. It looked like blood. It smelt like blood. I was completely deceived in my mind. I had these wailing and chanting sounds going on and I was about to pass out. And just as I was about to pass out, I felt two angels grab hold of me. Now I didn't see them. It's only looking back that I believe they were angels and they grabbed hold of me. I remained conscious and they started to push me out of the restaurant. Now the restaurant has a revolving door for in and a revolving door for out. They push me through into the galley. And I'd never noticed, but just to the right of the, inside the revolving doors of the galley, was some steps going down to F deck. Now, crew are not allowed in passenger accommodation. If you get caught, you get logged and you get fined. But these angels were pushing me down the stairs and I got to the bottom and I turned round the corner and there in front of me was the cabin that they were in, these two women, Judith and Beryl. Any of you who are listening to this have ever been on a ship. It's like a city. Even if you know your way around, it's impossible to find your, your way around. And here I was at the bottom of the galley, on F deck, round the corner was their cabin. By this time, I was shaking violently and I was crying, sobbing, in fact. And so I banged on their door and it was like they were waiting for me. They said, oh, hello, very calmly, come in. And I thought, what's the matter with them? Why don't they do something? Why don't they do something? And she came over to me, she sat me down on the bunk and she looked at me and she said, do you believe that Jesus Christ can save you? I'd never heard such a thing in my life. I didn't want to be a religious person, but I was in desperate need now. And the word yes didn't come from my mind. As I'm telling you, it's all scrambled. I felt the word come up out of my heart and into my mouth and I said yes. Now she put her hands on my head and the other woman had a hand on her back and one on my shoulder. And she said, right, say this after me. I couldn't speak. I began to choke on my tongue. I was like this. And she shook me and she said, say it. To this day, I don't remember what she told me to say. Whether it was the blood of Jesus Christ uh, cleanses you from sin, sets you free. I don't know, I couldn't say it because I was choking. And she said, say it. And once it was out, I then felt this pressure in my stomach, or, or like a welling up and a, and a pushing and a, something coming out of my, my mouth. And then she continued to pray. And all I could hear really was this other woman saying, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. I thought I was out of it completely. Then I felt this welling up again, coming up from the pit of my stomach and being pushed out. Now these, I believe and know now, all these years I've been giving my testimony, were demons. They were casting demons out of me. The biblical truth that people can be possessed. But I knew, I didn't realize what was going on. And the thing is, you know, I tried to give up the drugs, but I couldn't. And I believe when I gave my will away, when I took the next drug and I gave my will away, I allowed these evil spirits to come into my life. I didn't invite them, I didn't ask them, but I believe that's when they came in. The will that a person is given by God, I believe, is a very strong thing. And when he sets us free, he gives us our will back to choose to follow him. Again, 
she prayed over me. Now this time, I felt a burning pain into my chest. It was like a Dracula film. The, the cross that I had on was cursed. And she grabbed hold of my hand, she pulled all the chains off, she flung them on the ground, and she prayed again, and another one came up. And another demon came up and out of me. I didn't see them. I screamed a bit, but I, it wasn't that super dramatic. And then she stopped and she said to me, can you see the light? And again, it was like I could see my mind. And I said, no, it's all gray and speckled. And she put her hands on me again and she prayed. And the last one came out and everything was white and bright and clean as if I'd never touched a drug. And I tasted heaven. I didn't see Jesus. I didn't go for a long walk in heaven with him. But I was tasting what it means to be in heaven with him. The peace, the love, the joy, everything that I believe heaven really means to us. I don't know how long I was standing there, but I do remember I was standing up like this. And I turned to these two women who were sitting on the, on the bunk just watching me. And I said, if this is what it's like, let's go now. I wanted to lie on the floor and die, just to be in heaven permanently. And they said, oh, no, 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 you can't go yet. You've got work to do for God. I thought, what? They had these big Bibles, and the first scripture they turned to was, and you shall learn the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And then they turned it over to the well-known um, scripture, John 3, 16. But they put my name in it, for God so loved Russ that he gave his only begotten son, that when you believe in him, you will have eternal life. This had only had, this took five minutes, maybe five, ten minutes. I knew then that I had to go back up into the restaurant, but I was completely delivered of all the drugs. I said uh, to them, what shall I do? And they said to me, you say, in the name of Jesus, I command you to be silent, I command you to be still, it will be done for you. So I then went out, back to the restaurant, and I'm muttering this under my breath, in the name of Jesus, I command you to be silent. I command you to be still. Now, when I walked into the restaurant, I could pick out every Satanist because there were Satanists on the ship who had been celebrating this Valpurgis night the night before. And when they saw me, they were shocked. But they knew that I'd gone to God that night. And I think many others had gone the other way. It's not for me to say, but I know I went to God that night and they were uh, worried about it. And so I did then felt that what they were going to do was kill me physically because they'd failed to get me spiritually. So I, I, the next day I went to the women, I found them, and I said, I think they're gonna kill me because they failed to get me spiritually. And they said, turn to their Bibles again and they turned to Psalm 121. I will lift up mine eyes into the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The Lord will guard your coming in and going out from this day forth and forevermore. I thought, well, they can't do anything now because I belong to God. And so I went back up to my cabin, I was five days from home. It was a funny time, you know, because that next day, and I think this is a very important point of my testimony, my sharing with you how I became a believer in Jesus. I was in my cabin and God spoke to me. Now I know what you're thinking. Oh, now God's speaking to him. But what I mean is, I would never have this thought ever. God said to me, forgive your mother. Wow. At this point, I do get emotional, even 50 years later. 
he said, forgive your mother. And I said, I was thought I was being very clever. I said, how can I forgive her? She's not here. And he said, it's enough that I tell you to forgive her. Like that, like a child. So I, again, put my hands up. I don't know why. This is the thing about raising your hands before God. I said, okay, at your command, I forgive my mother. And I felt him again put his hand into my heart and he got all, hold of all the hate, the anger, the bitterness, all of those things I had against my mother and he pulled it out by the roots. I felt it coming up out of my heart because man believes with his heart and confesses with his lips. This is another scripture in the Bible. And he pulled it out and it was gone. One of the most important things to God is forgiveness. Even in the Lord's Prayer it says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. You may be thinking, well, I can't forgive. I've heard that so many times. But if you ask God to help you to forgive, he surely will help you. Thank you for listening to my story, my testimony. I'm so glad to be able to do this. I've given my testimony so many times to so many people. I think they'll put it on my gravestone. <laughs> he, he gave his testimony more than anybody else. But I never videoed it. And uh, as I'm going to be 70 years of age on January the 1st, I'm really thankful for this opportunity to put it down for other people to hear and to experience God for themselves. Thank you for listening.